worship it. Just love on it. Thanks to the Lord for He is good. him up.
to have the praises of the Lord, but he can't. That's the reason I like this part. All of men's glory fades away like a spring flower in the rain. No fallen angel is worthy without you, Lord. I'd be so lost without you, Jesus. I'd be in despair and depression if it weren't for you. But your joy comes like the morning light and lifts me up out of the pit. Hallelujah to the Lord. darkness of life, you lift me up, and you call me your son, I don't understand that, Lord, how you could call someone so vile and unworthy your son, why would you take the ring? and put it on my finger and make me one of yours. After all I've done, I don't understand your love, but I do thank you, Jesus. Oh, I humbly bow before you and I thank you, Lord. I lift my hands. How can I keep silent in the presence of the Lord who has saved and delivered me? <laughs> I rejoice and laugh before your presence, Lord, because your grace and your mercy 
has reached down and said, I love you through all the sin, and I'll forgive you, and I'll make you part of me. Thank you, Lord. Just indulge me a minute. I'm just in the middle of this. Glory. Hallelujah. Father, I can't explain this kind of love, this kind of grace. I know that I still break your heart. And yet you run to welcome me. This is my song of praise.
If we would think the ocean could fill And were the skies of parchment made If every stalk on this earth were a quill And every man a scribe by trade To write the love of God above It would drain the ocean dry Nor could the scroll contain the whole Both stretch from sky From sky to sky Lift your voice and praise him. Lift your voice and praise him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh.
Until of all you've done Of how you changed my life And wiped away the past I want to shout it out From every rooftop scene For now I know that God is for me Not a
just dance before the Lord. Hallelujah. You know what I was just thinking when we were all dancing? I closed my eyes and I thought, wouldn't it be great if I jump up one time and don't hit the ground again? <laughs> yeah. I love the Lord. I love you, Jesus. I want to see your face. I want to see your face. I can't wait till when I have a better body than this so I can not wear out. Because if you've walked into this service and you're not a Christian or you're not, you don't know anything about church or you don't know anything about worshiping the Lord, if you kind of like this, just heaven is going to be like a lot more of this. And if you think this is emotionalism, just wait till I see his face. <laughs> Oh, this is just heaven practice. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Turn around to somebody and say, I'm having heaven practice. You may be seated. God bless you. <laughs> Brother Mike. Bless you, Jesus. Those of you that are standing around the back, you can stay standing. Everybody else sit down. I just want to read scripture to you. Now, please don't get emotional now, okay? We're just going to read the scriptures. It's a very, very unemotional time when we read the scriptures. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not hold on to his equality with God, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, nothing emotional here, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Nothing to shout about so far. Therefore, 
Yes, Lord. Yes. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, at the name of Jesus, Let me, let me compose myself. Then at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Oh, yes, Lord. Jesus. Lord. You might say I never quite responded to the reading of Scripture like that. Or maybe you never quite saw it as real as it is. We're just getting a tiny little glimpse of the reality of it, friends. If we had a clue to 1% of all the things that God has done for us, friends, we'd be considered raving fanatics in the eyes of the world. Thank you, Jesus. Our eyes get open just a little bit. We're on our face. We're shouting for joy. We're weeping. We're overcome. We're running around the building. Just when we see a little glimpse of the goodness of God towards us. What's going to happen on that day when we realize it is done? We are in his presence forever. Glorify. Yes, Lord. Just want to read one other passage to you. Steve asked last night, he said, where was it where they burned their magical books? And my mind said 19, Acts 19, my, my voice said 18. And I said to myself, did I say 18? And I was ready to correct myself, but I thought, well, just let it stand because he was about to lift me up, and this was God's way of humbling me. <laughs> Thankfully, there was someone next to my wife who said it's 19, and she said to me today, where did you say it was? I said, I said 18, but it's 19. Well, anyway... It's an interesting thing in the 19th chapter. You may not have ever made this connection, but, but hear me for a second, because I believe that we're going to have more and more power confrontations in days to come. More and more of the devil kind of coming out of the woodwork, and we'll find out who's got the goods and who doesn't have the goods. Paul said the kingdom of God is not a matter of words, but of power. And you know, I, I wonder about those who say that the days of miraculous healings and deliverances are over. I wonder, where have all the demons gone? I mean, if demons were being driven out left and right and the sick were being healed left and right, we know the sick are still around, where are all the demons? We don't need to be driving demons out of people and setting captives free. Where have all the demons gone? Now, let me tell you honestly that if you'll go over to places in Africa and India, and go into very rural areas, you'll see the demonized people just wide out in the open, foaming at the mouth and acting wild. And, and, you know, we'll deal with people like that in the name of Jesus. In the more sophisticated pagan countries like America and most of Europe, the demon-possessed people are running for office, educating our children, <laughs> acting on our screens in Hollywood. And, but see, as God starts moving, this stuff starts coming up to the surface. And suddenly we'll be going into nice places. Maybe you'll be going in with your nice business suit to meet with somebody. And suddenly the CEO of this company will start foaming at the mouth and growling. And you'll say, in the name of Jesus, come out and it'll shake up the whole company. <laughs> so
So we know in Acts the 19th chapter that it says in verse 18, many of those who believe now came and openly confessed their evil deeds. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. And the note in my Bible says that a drachma was a silver coin worth a day's wages. Can you imagine the amount of money put in those magical arts and scrolls? But you know the miracle that turned them around? It's the seven sons of Sceva. When they tried to drive the demon out of the man, and this one man beat them all up, ripped their clothes off, they said, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, and this one demon-possessed man said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And tore them up, and they ran out of there beaten and bloody. And listen to what it says. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. And then people believed based on that miracle. The demon-possessed man wasn't delivered, but they found out the power of the devil was real and the power of Jesus was real, and you can't play games with it, and you can't mock it, and you can't claim to have it if you don't really have it. And let me tell you something, friends. The days are coming when we'll find out who's who. See, a lot of our society knows about the reality of the devil. When I met my wife, Nancy, she wasn't my wife then. She was an, a Jewish atheist at that point. And the first thing that she understood and believed was the reality of evil and the person of the devil, that there was a real evil force in this world. And then God opened up her eyes to salvation through the blood of Jesus. People know about demons. They know about all these stories and witchcraft and this and that. They see the power of evil in our society. I tell you, when the church rises up in the name of Jesus and the power of the Spirit and the devil is driven back and everyone sees and knows there is power in the name of Jesus and the name of Jesus alone. All the reproach that came to the church through all the scandals we've had in recent years, through compromise in the body, people are going to see, begin to see there is a real Jesus, there is a real church, there is a real people of God, and we are either going to be under the power of the devil or under the power of the Lord, and the choice is going to be clear to this generation. God will do it. Let me encourage you, friend, to get all the way in under. Not to play games, not to see if you can serve one master one day and another master the another day. No, friend. Put yourself totally under the lordship of Jesus. Let your whole life be an offering that's pleasing to him so he can work through you. And when you have an encounter with the devil, friend, and I'll tell you, you go out on the mission field and you deal with some of these things and, and you find out, realize, here's some little worker that you didn't really think too much of, but this person's been in the secret place and they've been praying and they've been fasting and their hands are clean and their heart's pure. And you may have your little missions team gathered around some demonized people praying over them and binding and loosing and nothing's happened. The devil's saying, bind and loose all you want. You're not touching me. And this little worker, nobody in the eyes of the world, this little worker comes over full of the Spirit, and in one second that person is instantly set free. Friends, that's the way we want to be God-dominated, God-possessed people, God-filled people, demonstrating the power of the gospel through what he's done in us and what he does through us. Let your life be a testimony. I have been changed by the name of Jesus, and I am not who I was. Look at me. Watch me. I will demonstrate the power of the gospel in my life and watch God's power set captives free and loose prisoners of every kind and let it be known that what the cults couldn't do and what the programs couldn't do and what the psychics couldn't do, the name of Jesus can do and does do. Bless you, Lord. If you're wondering why I'm so reserved, it's because as the president of our school of ministry, I have to be more reserved and sophisticated and intellectual. It's unbecoming to get emotional and to shout and to dance. Friends, if you believe that, get saved. I would be more, I would be more blunt and direct, but I don't want to offend anyone. Brother Paul Wetzel is going to come and receive an offering in a moment. I just want to mention something to you. Not for the offering tonight, but just to, to pray about as you leave here. In our school, we bring in a, a very high percentage of people by scholarship. And most of us involved in leadership in the revival take money from our own ministries to give towards scholarships for students so that we can help as many students come through that can't afford to get through. A lot of students are here and their parents won't give them a dime 
because they don't want them to be getting ready for ministry and they're not happy that they were saved and they're not helping them at all. So all of us help out any way that we can and, and our school absorbs as many as we can by way of scholarship. But I'm asking you when you leave here, grab a brochure about the school and pray and see if you want to help underwrite some of our students. I don't want you to do anything to take away from this offering now, but I want you to do that. On the way out, take one of the brochures and ask the Lord, could you help? Whether it's sponsoring a student in full for a year or partially helping a student with some of their tuition, it would be a blessing to us and help us to absorb even more. And you'll be standing with us and helping equip laborers for the harvest field. Amen? Amen. All right, Brother Paul, would you come? And the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth. A thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look about you. All assemble and come to you. Your sons come from afar, and your daughters are carried on the arm. Then you will look and be radiant, and your heart will throb and swell with joy. The wealth of the seas will be brought to you. To you, the riches of the nations will come. When the glory of the Lord. It's returned to the church, y'all. The glory of the Lord. The glory of the Lord. The glory of the Lord's here in this place tonight. I thought I was going to not be able to get up here. I, my feet kind of got heavy over there. I am dry and thirsty, Lord. Send your hand. Send your hand. touch again send your rain send your Cleansing now, send your rain, send your rain. Please forgive my every sin. Send your rain, hold on, send your rain.
ti so Lift up your hand and sing to the Lord I need it, I need it I need your rain, Lord I need it, I need it I need your rain Some of you that are so hung up on everything being perfect, you'll never make it through revival. Amen. I know there's those out there going, I cannot believe he's hooking up the wireless mic in front of us. I just could never do that. Friend, <clears throat> after a while, it just doesn't matter, you know? You may wonder where some of the songs come from at the Brownsville Revival. They come right out of a service. We'll be over there, and you, you may be here tonight going, I don't know any of the words. We don't either, friends. That's right. He, he's making them up. That's right. So quit complaining. That's right. Just sort of enter in and move your mouth. <laughs> would like everyone to stand. Those of you at home, I would like for you to stand also. We believe everyone is here under divine appointment. And before we pray together, I'd like to say something to those of you that are visiting for the first time and you don't really understand the exuberant worship. And I can understand where you're coming from. I, I, was, I, was on the, I was a drug addict for years. I was on the streets. And if I had walked into a service like this, I, I don't know necessarily if I would have hated it, but I would not have understood it. Okay, and so I empathize with you that you may not understand how anyone can be so elated and so uh, just so enthralled in, in worship like that. But friend, let me tell you something that, that we have tapped into. God made us to worship him. He made us to worship him. And there is someone inside of you, there's a, there's a, there's what I would call, what I call the spirit man inside of you that is starving. And you try to feed that spirit man relationships, and he's not happy. You try to feed him money, he doesn't care about that. You try to feed him fame, he doesn't want fame. There's a man inside of you, there's one inside of you that all he's going to be happy with is to connect. It's to connect, connect with God. And that's why yeah, you can look at out across this congregation tonight and people are weeping and wailing and lifting. Grown men are crying. And they're, then they're dancing and then they're crying again. And some of these men are businessmen. They have grueling jobs. They're going back to on Monday, day in and day out. Some of them work on Wall Street. Some of them wheel and deal. We've had millionaires. We've had billionaires come to this revival. And they do the same thing. Many of us are just worshiping God because they know all the money in the world, all the deals they make on Wall Street don't come close to tapping in. So, friend... You were made to worship him. And I remember the first time I walked into a church after being a drug addict for many years and I saw people with their hands lifted up. And I remember, this honestly happened, friend, I remember looking at my hands. No one had to tell me to lift my hands. I saw what they were doing and I looked at my hands and these hands used to hold needles. These hands used to rob people. These hands used to hold guns. These hands used to stick needles in my arm. These hands used to roll marijuana joints. These hands used to steal from stores. And I looked at these hands and I went, these are yours, Jesus. And I began to worship him. It was so natural. It was so natural to lift my hands. And I was from a Lutheran background, friend, but it was so natural to lift my hands. It just made sense to surrender and say, Jesus, you have all of me. 
everything. So those of you that are here for the first time or you're visiting this week and you just don't understand or somebody drug you in this place tonight and you sort of stuck here between two friends. I, I, I beg of you, just open up your heart and, and let Jesus speak to you. Let him minister to you. And you don't have to be like anybody else, okay? You don't have to jump and dance. What you have to do is open up and say, Jesus. And some of, there's people here that don't even believe in God. I know that for a fact. There's people here that do not believe in God. You don't believe he exists. I can handle that, okay? What I can't handle is people that say they believe in God and don't. Liars. But if you're here and you say, I don't believe in God, that's fine. God can handle that. That's not going to harm, you know. He, that, doesn't, that doesn't bother him. He hates liars. He despises liars. Satan is a liar. But if you'll stand there and go, I don't believe in God. I don't believe in God. God can handle that, friend. So just be honest tonight. Say, I, don't, I have absolutely no faith in Jesus. There's many people here that do, uh, that don't have any faith in God at all. He can handle that. Start there, okay? Lay that foundation. God, I don't believe in you, but I am open. I am open. I'm not closed. I'm open for you. If you are out there, if there is a God in heaven, I don't believe there is, but if there's a God in heaven, then you can speak to me. Everyone pray this prayer right now. I want everyone to pray with me out loud. If you're a God hater, I want you to pray. If you're a God lover, I want you to pray out loud. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus speak, to my heart. speak to my heart. Change my life. Change my life. In your precious name, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to do something that um, I really feel the Lord wants me to do. I'd like for Chip Woolwine to stand, if you would. Brother Chip, where are you at? Just stand right there. Remain standing. I'm not going to bring Chip in front of everyone right now. I want him to just remain standing where he's at. Many of you understand um, what is going on in uh, Mr. Woolwine's life. Others of you don't. So if you just remain with us, Chip, for a few minutes standing, I want to explain something to this church because I want people to be praying for you. Chip Woolwine is a man of God. He loves the Lord. He's uh, up to the end of last school year was the assistant principal, am I correct, at Niceville High. And Chip is one of those people that believes that people need the Lord. He just believes that, you know, um, before I ever heard of Chip Woolwine, kids came to me crying about Niceville. I've never told you this, Chip. But they came to me squalling and bawling about, about knives and drugs and occult worship and things that were going on at Niceville High School. And I, I pray for Niceville. I've spoken in a lot of schools around the nation, and I prayed for Niceville. I didn't know what was going on with your life and how much you had a burden for the kids. And so there were times where kids would have a need and Chip, uh, being a man of God and also a principal of the school, uh, would talk to them about Jesus, you know, just openly share, not in a rebellious way towards the authority of the, 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 the laws of the government, but if they came up and the kids were, really wanted to talk, then he would talk. And he came under a lot of fire for that. I also came under fire for baptizing kids at a FCA meeting outside off the school grounds, which is a student-sponsored meeting. And I just want to encourage you tonight, brother, there's something happening in this nation. First of all, the majority of this nation, whether you believe it or not, believes in you, believes in what you've done and what you do. See, this nation understands, it's beginning to understand, that you can walk into a school library, any school library in this nation, and pull a book on witchcraft down. A principal can, or a teacher. They can pull down a book, a book on sorcery, which has all the details how to perform a seance. And they can sit down in the library and open it up and read it to the kids. All over this nation, you can do that. No one is going to raise an eyebrow. But you can walk a few, because that's the religious part of the library or the philosophy, and you can look down a few rows and find a Bible. And the same principle can take the Bible down and open it up 
and read from the Bible, even what the Bible says about sorcery, and lose his job. And America knows there's something wrong with that. America knows that because 84% of North American adults, even though they're not standing with you, brother, 84% of North American adults believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. 94% of North American adults have a Bible in their home. 94% of adult of, of our homes in America have a Bible. That means only 6% of homes in America do not have a Bible like the one you have in your lap right now. And so basically what we're dealing with is a nation that has to be awakened. If they believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, they need a slap in the face. They need to be awakened to the fact that there's a whole lot more to it than just believing he's the Son of God. I want to encourage you. I read, uh, Chip, to the congregation a couple days ago. I don't have the clipping with me. Maybe you're familiar with the, uh, what President Clinton has just done with the federal employees. I want everyone to hear this, and Chip, I want you to remain standing. Just the other day, it was Thursday last week, a week ago, Bill Clinton... changed a few things in the federal government. This is one of the things he changed. See, now, right now, Bill Clinton has nothing to lose. Everyone understand? He, has not, he can't run a third term. He's, uh, he's, in his, he's won the second term, so he's president, whether you like it or not. And he's president, whether heathens like it, he's just president. Okay, now he can do things and it don't matter. He can do what he wants to do because he's president and he doesn't have to run for election again. So he decided we need more freedom, religious freedom. So he said this, in the federal government now, if you want to bring a Bible to work, you can bring a Bible to work. If you want to lay it on your desk, you can lay it on your desk. If you want to read it during work, you can read it during work. If you want to proselytize, this is in the paper, that means at work, share your faith with the computer technician next to you. As long as they're not fighting you and they want you to talk to them, it's okay now. It's going to be a law. It's going to be okay in America to do that. Friend, in America, Something is happening in this nation right now. Something is happening. Now, any of you know, that know anything about our president, you may disagree with a lot of things about him, but there's a heritage there. There is a heritage that has to do with Jesus Christ, his blood, the cross. There's a strong evangelical heritage in his life. And I personally know some of the people that know him personally, and it's a lot stronger than some of you Understand, sure he's gone through a lot and he's done some things that most of us would not agree with. But the bottom line is, there's a gut belief there that Jesus Christ is who he says he is. <clears throat> and so there's some changes, Chip, coming about. And I'm saying this for a reason. This is just last week that he said that. Now this is going to cause no small stir in Washington and the world. But this is the top down, okay? Now what's going to happen, Chip? People are going to start saying, well, wait a minute. Now, if they can do that in a federal government building at the Pentagon, if they can do that, if, if they can pull out a Bible in Congress, if they can pull out a Bible in the law offices of the FBI, if they can pull out a Bible at the CIA office and talk to somebody else about Jesus, then... Why can't we do it in our high schools? <clears throat> can't sit down yet, brother. We're going to pray for you. And so that's where this nation is moving, and I want everyone to be encouraged. Between now and the year 2000, it's going to be like a fire that's been fanned with wind, friend. 
It's going to blaze. And if there's, been ever, if there's ever been a time that you're going to open up your mouth concerning the laws of this land, concerning what you believe and what you want to see passed in this nation, it's now. That, what, what, what Clinton just did, should be a swift kick in your pants, friend. That should be a wake-up call to every Christian in America that God is on the move. Friend, I believe within a year or so, if a kid's going through problems at school, he could, he, he's going to have the freedom to go to a Christian counselor on the school grounds. Where? And when he goes to that Christian counselor, that Christian counselor is not going to slip a condom under the table. That Christian counselor is not going to take them in the van off to have an abortion. That Christian counselor is going to take their hands. And that Christian counselor is going to be able to say things like this, Chip. They're going to be able to say, would you like me to lay hands on you and pray for you? It's going to happen in America. It's going to happen in America. I want everyone to stand, and I want you to turn around and face Chip Woolwine. Extend your right hand and pray this prayer out loud with me. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus right, now, right now, I pray, I pray for, one man, for one man, Chip Woolwine. Chip Woolwine. I, pray I pray for strength. I pray for wisdom. I pray for, wisdom. I pray for understanding. During this, time. during this time. I pray that he would stand, pray that he would stand. In, the ahead, in the days ahead. Whatever battle, whatever battle he, is he is facing, may he know, may he know in, his in his spirit that I am standing, I am standing with, him. with him. I pray for him tonight, pray for him tonight that he would sense, he would sense your presence and when he is in a difficult situation and he needs an answer, he needs a word, I pray, Jesus, that it would come from heaven at that perfect time, words of wisdom, and he would speak out as a man who is speaking for God. I pray your blessings, your blessings on Chip, on Chip his, family, his family, and everyone, and everyone. at Niceville High. Nice High. In your precious name, in, precious in name. the name of Jesus, name of Jesus. Amen. amen. Glory. We don't know. We don't know the outcome of this what's going to happen, you know, and I know it could be big. We really don't know what's going to take place. But this is one of many, many battles that are going to be fought over the next few years in America. Many of you are familiar with what's going on in Alabama with the Ten Commandments, how one judge did not want to remove them from the walls of his courtroom. And the federal government says, you will remove those Ten Commandments. And he said, I will not remove the Ten Commandments. And then, and then the governor got involved, Bob James of Alabama. His family comes to this revival. He gets involved and he says, because the federal government says, you will take down those Ten Commandments. And he says, I will not. And Bob James says this. If they try to get you to take, if they try to take them down, I'll bring in the National Guard. And then, and then South Carolina calls and says, if you bring in, your, if they come and try to take those Ten Commandments down, we'll bring our National Guard over there and we'll stand with you. And it's not, friend, it's not about a plaque hanging on the wall. There's a principle there. 
You, you, take the, you take the Ten Commandments down from the wall, they're going to want in God we trust off the coins. But I want to tell you something. It has stopped. The downward slide, you know, the prayer out of schools and all this junk, it has stopped. It has stopped. We're not going down anymore. It's starting to climb back up. It's going to go all the way up. We're going to have prayer back in schools. Of course, of course, they never could take prayer out of schools. You know, nobody can stop prayer in schools. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Well, I believe in miracles. I'd like to preach to you tonight a message for the next few minutes entitled, Another Hungry Heart. Another Hungry Heart. How many have, this is your first service at the revival. This is your first time visitors. Lift up your hand high. God bless you. We welcome you. How many of you, this is your first week of revival. Lift up your hand. I'd like to apologize for how difficult it is at the very end when we start praying for folks. It's just crowded. It's stupid to apologize. There's nothing we can do about it, you know. And it is, it's just the way it is. It's crowded, friend. And it's, we haven't figured out any other way to do it because there's, a lot of you are like, um, um, I don't know, maniacs. <laughs> I, I don't know how to describe you, man, but it's like, I'm, I'm going to receive, and I mean, you, you, you don't care. You don't care. And I've watched people just pressed up against each other like this, you know, and all smashed into one another and, and uh, just standing there, you know. And I look over at a suit, and I'll see a suit, and you can tell, you know, it's a, it's a fancy $800,000, $900,000 Italian suit, you know, and the tie's all ripped to shreds, and people are just, you know, they don't care. Our shoes. In this revival, every night at the end of the meeting, I'll look at my shoes at the end to see if they're still there <laughs> and to see if they need to be sent to the shoe shop because, I mean, our, we get trampled. We get trampled, and, and I've had tassels. I mean, the tassels, there's been tassels left all over this church because <laughs> one lady one night, she got touched. We prayed for her. She starts jumping up and down. She's got these spike heels, okay? <laughs> she goes, glory! Wham! Right into my toe, boy. And I start going, glory! <laughs> so we apologize, friend, for the... It's just crowded. We don't know what to do about it. I opened up the Word this morning, and um, don't turn to this Scripture yet. This is not the Scripture, but um, I don't, opened it up to Mark chapter 5. And I just began to read the Word early this morning. And the, the whole chapter, the miracles in the Word of God, friend, are phenomenal. I don't know how you read the Word, but sometimes you can just get in it and you go, this is uncanny what life was like back then. Watching Jesus must have been incredible, man. Just hanging around Him. You know, He's just trucking down the road, you know, on His way to somewhere, and, and he, he, he goes, what's that going on over there, boys? They go, it's a funeral. Well, let's go check that out. Come on. <laughs> Excuse me, anybody die over here? You know, it must have been incredible being around Jesus. Just awesome. You know, Jesus, the people are hungry. They're really hungry. Is there a store closed by? You know, stores closed. We broke too, Jesus. Have them all sit down in groups here. You know, did you find any food? Yeah, we found a few pieces of bread and some, some fish. Start distributing this stuff. Father, bless this. What it was like, friend. These are not just stories. Hanging around him must have been incredible. The raising of Lazarus, the cleansing of the ten lepers, the feeding of the five thousand, the raising of the widow's son, the turning of water into wine, the healing of the woman with the issue of blood, the raising of Jairus' daughter, the stilling of the raging sea, the opening of the eyes of the man born blind, the healing of the daughter of the Syrophoenician woman, the coin in the fish's mouth. Yeah. 
the opening of the eyes of the two blind men near Jericho, the cursing of the barren fig tree. What, what was it like hanging around him, friend? Phenomenal. These miracles, as you read them, and those of you that are brand new in Jesus, the Bible is there for you. It's, it's God's letter to you, and as you read it, don't just go through it, let it go through you. As you read it, look at these stories and walk with Jesus. Even if you only get five verses, walk through them through those verses and think about it, what it was like. What were the disciples going through when he said some of the things he said? When he was going to raise Lazarus from the, the tomb and he said, you know, roll the stone away. And who was it, Mary or Martha said he stinks? Who was it? Who? The people said it. That he's, surely he stinks by now. What it must have been like, friend, to watch him come out of the tomb. Live the word as you read it, friend. Pastors, I want to encourage you to do that too, those of you that are still visiting with us this weekend. Because sometimes you can open up the word and just read it looking for a sermon. And you'll find most sermons will come as you just in the word. Just in the word. Rather than digging for a sermon, just get into it. Say, Jesus, I love your word. These miracles are acts of God. They're recorded in the Word of God for us to learn about Him. The Bible, how many believe it's anointed of God? There's people in the United States that don't believe it is. But you know, something in my, I guess it's because I'm not a scholar, I've never doubted this Word. Even when someone comes up and says, that looks like a contradiction. And I don't understand it. It still, to me, is not a contradiction. It's still the Word, you know? And I had one man come up to, you, to me and said, how can you believe that? Just believe it. Just believe it. It's so simple. I can trust it. I've, I've stood on it. 2 Timothy 3.16 it said the word is given, it's inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, that means teaching, for reproof, that means conviction over sin, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. I'll never forget when I started reading it for the first time, friend, and I saw myself. How many have seen yourself in the word of God? We're fixing to in just a minute, friend. We're going to take one of the miracles, and I'm going to give you a few points from that miracle. This is, this is entitled, Another Hungry Heart. We're fixing to see ourselves in the Word of God. But I want to lay a little foundation. Miracles helped us instru instruct us in the ways of God. As I study the miracles, I see certain characteristics that were present that brought about the supernatural power of God. I see a pattern Dick Rubin often shares with us. When the pattern's right, the glory falls. I see a pattern in miracles. I see a pattern in revivals. Although all revivals are different, they're usually superseded by prayer. Revivals are usually superseded by a devastation spiritually of the nation. A, a rampant wickedness uh, abounds in the nation. And, and all these ingredients are there. And then here comes a revival. And it's, it's, it's repeated itself through history. Well, in the miracles in the Word of God, it's the same way. You'll see certain characteristics in the Word that brought on that miracle. And we're going to talk about that just for a few minutes. Will that be okay with everybody? One more thing before we go on. All miracles in the Word of God and that are happening today at Brownsville or at your local church, all of them will always be contested. They'll always be assaulted. They'll even be ridiculed by those who don't believe. I was always amazed when I first became a Christian 22 years ago and Jesus would heal somebody, like the withered arm, and heal. And, and I would read that and go, dear God, man, because I was a brand new Christian. You know, it's phenomenal. And then read in the Word where people said, you can't do that on Sunday. <laughs> Think about that, friend. That would be the same as, I'm, say, we, we wheel a man out here that's been a paraplegic for life and he's got... Or he's in a, in, in a diving accident and, and, uh, and his, his arms are the, the, the size of little fishing rods. He's just a little, just skin and, skin and bones. And, you, you, and Mike Brown walks up to him and says, in the name of Jesus, 
rise up and walk. And the man jumps out of the chair and begins running around the platform. And a deacon comes up and says, Mike, we don't pray, we don't pray for healings until the end of the service. Or something, you know, it's like, hello. I never understood that stuff, friend, but miracles are often contested. Remember what happened when Jesus began performing mighty works. They said, this fellow does not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. He was working miracles, and they said he's the devil casting out the devil. Even his resurrection was covered over. Great miracle. He rose from the dead. How many believe that? But listen to what Matthew 28, I'm telling you, friend, miracles will be contested. When I got saved, it was contested. My family said it'll never last. Immediately, rather than, wow, it'll never last. My friends, you'll never make it. But I've received Jesus in my heart. He's changed me. It'll never last. You'll never make it six months. You're going to fall back into sin. That wasn't real what you experienced. How many know what I'm talking about? Jesus rose from the dead. Listen to this, Matthew 28. Now while they were on their way, behold, some of the guards came into the city and reported to the chief priests all that had happened. And when they had assembled, this is not my text tonight, just listen. And when they had assembled with the elders and council together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers and said, you are to say his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this should come to the governor's ears, we will win him over and keep you out of trouble. And they took the money and did as they had been instructed. And this story was widely spread among the Jews and is to this day. Even the resurrection was contested and covered up. Miracles will be contested. Turn with me to Luke chapter 7. By the way, if you're ever healed of anything, get ready for people not to believe you. There are folks walking around with cups of cold water, friend. They don't want to hear it. And if you've been healed of cancer, they'll look at you and go, yeah, I heard that before. I know a lady that said she was healed and she died nine months later. Just get ready for it, friend. Get ready for it. It's going to be contested. But you know whether or not you were healed. Luke 7. And when he had completed all his discourse in the hearing of the people, verse 1, he went to Capernaum. And a certain centurion slave who was highly regarded by him was sick and about to die. And we heard about Jesus. He sent some Jewish elders asking him to come and save the life of his slave. And when they had come to Jesus, they earnestly entreated him, saying, He is worthy for you to grant this to him. For he loves our nation, and it was he who built our, our synagogue. Now Jesus started on his way with them, and when he was already not far from the house, the centurion sent friends saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself further, for I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. Verse 7, for this reason I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and he does it. Now when Jesus heard this, he marveled at him and turned and said to the multitude that was following him, I say to you, not even in Israel have I found such great faith. Verse 10, and when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the slave healed in good health. And it came about soon afterwards that he went to a city called Nain, and the disciples were going along with him according to comp company by a large multitude. Now as he approached the gate of the city, behold, a dead man was being carried out. The only son, I love this, friend. Just one miracle to the next. Oh, by the way, and he went on down the road and healed a dead man. We're talking about my Jesus here, friend. But we're going to talk about the centurion servant. We're really going to talk about the centurion. The man that went after God, another hungry heart. If you're taking notes, here's point numero uno. 
<laughs> Bienvenidos, hermanos. ¿De dónde son? ¿De dónde son? México. Bueno, bienvenidos. Another hungry heart. If you want a miracle tonight, friend, you want to receive from the Lord. Regardless of whether or not your miracle is forgiveness of sin, and that's a miracle. You need Jesus to wash you clean. That's what you need from Jesus tonight. You're in sin. Regardless of whether perhaps tonight your marriage is on the rocks and you're, you're, it's in shambles, or maybe it's almost falling apart. You're at the verge of your marriage falling apart. Maybe next week you already have an appointment with a lawyer to sit down and your marriage is going to go down the drain after 18 years, after 22 years. You need a miracle from God. You need God to intercede. You need him to come in and fix things. Or perhaps you're here tonight and you're a your cancer victim or you have AIDS. Something's going on in your physical body. You need the Lord to touch you. Well, I see characteristics throughout the Word of God, friend, that are common from Genesis to Revelation from those who receive from God. And we're going to talk just for a few minutes about those, and especially those of you that are backslidden in this room, you're living in sin, you're doing things that you know Jesus would never do. You need to listen to this because some of you in this room, you want God to work a miracle in your life. You want him to change you, but you don't want to do anything about it. You don't want to do anything. You want him to change you. I have met people that want God to take the lust out of their life. Now, if God does that, it's rare. Most of the time, you've got to get it out of your life. He will forgive you, he'll wash you, and he'll always give you a way to escape. But you're going to have to want it. You're going to have, if you want your marriage healed, you're going to, want, you're going to have to want your marriage healed. You've got to want it, friend. How many believe that? That's why I work a lot with drug addicts, and the first thing I ask a drug addict that comes to me and says, I want to be delivered from crack cocaine. I'll say, well, give me the crack. You know, I want to quit smoking. Fork them over. <laughs> you know? Well, you know. <laughs> How much crack you got at home? How much pot you got? A couple pounds? Three pounds? Four pounds? Bring them to the church. Let's flush them down the toilet. I really want to be delivered. I want this. I want that. A lot of times, friends, it's just a quick fix. It's called jailhouse salvation. You're in a little trouble. You want to get out, but it's not serious. Number one, the characteristic that I find in this man at the very beginning of his life, friend, of this story, is you've got to come to the end of your limitations. You've got to come to the end of your limitations. Your limitations are what you can do with all your strength, all your might. You've got to come to the end. You've got to come to the very, very bottom of the barrel. You must be in a place of destitution and exhaustion. You've got to be a place that you're saying, I can't go any further. Please, friend, listen to this, because this is the reason a lot of you don't receive from God. Because you're not at that place. You've got an ace in your back pocket. Well, if this doesn't work out, when people come here and they say, I'm going to try Jesus. You don't try Jesus. It's not something that, if he doesn't work, I'll do something else. He works. See, Jesus has a 100% cure rate. He's perfect. Everyone who's been serious with Jesus has been 100% cured of anything they've come with them. You're the problem. It's not Jesus. You don't go try him. That's why I'm working in Teen Challenge, which is a great ministry, and students would come in, and they would, they would look at Teen Challenge as a savior. And I'd tell them, i said, listen, let me tell you something. Teen Challenge, it's a 10-month to a year program. We're going to teach you the Bible. We're going to teach you how to pray. We're going to teach you how to worship God. But you can go through Teen Challenge just like you go through prison. I remember, guys, in Teen Challenge, we used to travel in a choir. I remember guys traveling in the choir. They would stand up in front of hundreds of people in a church and share their testimony. They would share their story, how God delivered them from drugs and everything. You know what they had learned how to do? Share their story. They were professional at it. They knew when to cry, when not to cry. 
They knew just what to say. I remember one guy used to, this guy drove me nuts, man. He had one little ratty suit, you know. He'd stand up and go, I might not have the best clothes in the world. You know, he said, my underwear might have holes in it. My suit is all ripped to shreds. And boy, the grandmas would be out there going, oh, oh. you'd hear pocketbooks opening, you know, out there. What a con. He was a con before Teen Challenge, a con in Teen Challenge, and a con when he got out of Teen Challenge. But they'd get in the program, they would sing in these choirs, they would share their testimony. Man, they'd be so religious, so spiritual. Why? They learned how to do that. Then they graduate, and the first thing they do when they graduate is go to a bar and get drunk. Next thing you know, they're on drugs again. Why? Playing the game, man. They never came to the end. They were never at the end of their limitations. And I'm going to tell you about this man that came to Jesus. You've got to be at that place, friend, where it's over, washed up. Mike Brown shares his story and how he got to a place where he didn't want to stick a needle in his arm no more. He wanted to give up drugs. He didn't want to be involved in that anymore. He gave his life to Jesus. He was at the end. His friends had gotten saved. They were at the end. I could share you a lot of stories, friend. This pastor right here, people want to know about the great Brownsville revival, how it broke out. Well, see, I was with this man a year, almost two years before the revival broke out. We were in the back room. I don't know if you remember this, Pastor. I walked in. It was a Sunday night. I walked in. This is in 1991 or 1992, something like that, maybe in early 1993. I walked into the back room. He shook my hand. We sat down. He said, talk to us about revival tonight, Steve, just for a couple minutes because we're praying tonight. That's what we're going to do. We're going to pray tonight. It was Sunday night. They were praying. Remember? You've heard about the banners and all. They were praying. It was a Sunday night. Talking about revival, he said, I'm sick of everything else. I'll never forget it, Pastor. I wrote it in my journal. He said, I'm sick of everything. I'm sick of church. I'm sick of religion. I'm sick of day in and day out life. I want revival. <laughs> and until you're sick of all of it, friend, why should God bring you revival? You won't appreciate it. You'll just add it to your agenda, and it'll go on for a couple weeks, and you'll get tired. Why? Because you want to play golf. And it's messing up your golf game. And you had a vacation plan. Friend, I had a vacation plan too a couple years ago. <laughs> My kids are still asking me. Daddy, when are we going to go on that what, vacation plan? It'll be next century and we'll be still going, Daddy, isn't it? Kids will be married, have kids, you know, and they'll go, Daddy, we're still going on, the, we're still in revival, son. I'm just, but Daddy, I'm 36 years old and we've never been on vacation. <laughs> But the man was hungry for revival. You got to come to the end of your limitation. Listen to this guy. This centurion was able to administrate. He was able to lead. He was able to command. He was able to bless the Jewish people. He had authority that enabled him to move mountains. He could make things happen, but he couldn't heal his servant. You can do everything, sir. You are talented. You can build houses. You can build a business. You can make money and buy the groceries for the family. But you can't save your own soul. You got to come to the limitations. You can do everything, but you can't shake this pornography thing. You can't shake this lust thing. It's got a hold of you, got a grip on you. I hope somebody's listening tonight, friend. You got to come to the end, the very end, what some might call rock bottom. I preach a lot in this revival. I mentioned the woman with the issue of blood in Mark chapter 5 simply because it's my favorite story in the Bible. This is that woman that spent all her money. She had seen all the doctors and had only grown worse. You can read it later in Mark chapter 5. But the Bible doesn't tell us what kind of woman she was. Maybe she was an excellent mother. 
Maybe she was a Proverbs 31 mother. Maybe she sold cloth like Lydia did in the Bible. Maybe she was a businesswoman. Maybe she was an excellent singer. Perhaps she was extremely skilled in basket weaving. Maybe she was an incredible wife. I don't know anything about the woman. All I know is that she was sick for 12 years. She had spent all her money. She had seen all the doctors, and she was getting worse. She was at the end, friend. And if you want a miracle tonight, if you want God to touch you, this is another hungry heart right here that Jesus saw coming. You've got to be at that place or you're going to go after him like the woman with the issue of blood. She got up out of her bed, and she crawled across those desert sands. She probably dripped, had a trail of blood following her all the way to the Savior. She broke through the crowd. She said, let me by. I'm going to touch him or I'm going to die. She said, if I could just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. I'm talking about a desperation, friend. The other night, Charlotte, bring me that thing out, out here. Or Doug. The other night, I don't, when was this, last week? that I, Last Wednesday night. I forgot what the message was titled. But it's all just sort of one big glob, friend. <laughs> <laughs> See, I came here with five messages and used them up the first week. And so now it's just one big just message. It's like one long message. But I set up a table last Wednesday night up here, a beautiful banqueting table with, with, with uh, beautiful candles, silver candles, and dinner played, and, and a salad played, and a, and a soup bowl, and a teacup, and silverware, and beautiful folded napkins. It was elegant, something you would see in the nicest restaurants. Even lit the three candles and put a rose in the vase. It was perfect. And that's how a lot of us are in the religious world. We got our little table set. It's just perfect. And you go, waiter, Holy Spirit, please, I would like an appetizer now. I think I'll take tongues. I would like tongues, Holy Spirit. I want to be a part of the rest of the, give me tongues, Holy Spirit, now. That's our religious table, friend. We got it set. We got our own menu. We know what we want. Who cares what God wants? We know what we want. And we wonder why God never feeds us, why he never takes care of us, why he's not standing there waiting over us, friend. He ain't never visited your restaurant. Trust me, friend. He doesn't care about your banqueting table. He doesn't care about your little prissiness. God. God is after people that are standing in a food line that are going, Jesus, feed me, feed me, Jesus, feed me, Jesus, feed me, Jesus, just a little bread, just a cup of water, Jesus, feed me anything, anything, Jesus, feed my soul. That's what he's after, friend. He's after hungry hearts. He's after people that come to the end of their limitations. They're at the very end of what they can do. They're going, God... I want something to eat, and I want it now. God, feed me. Feed me, Jesus. And the Lord drops a piece of bread on your plate and pours a, a, a half a cup of water. And you know what you do? You go, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. This is so good, Jesus. This is so good, Jesus. You don't know how good this is, Jesus. This is so good. And you eat, and the father's looking down at you, going, man, you know, why don't you toss him a filet mignon? You know? It's the way it works, friend. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Some of you in this room, some of you in this room, you've tried it all. You've seen the psychiatrist, the psychologist. You've been hypnotized to quit smoking. Some of you have 18 nicker patches all over your body. <laughs> you'd wear them on your forehead, but you'd wonder what people would say about you. 
You're on Prozac, chunking vitamins like M&Ms. You've been to camp marriage counselors. You've tried your, you've turned to your friends and they were unable to help. You can be a rocket scientist friend with the full mental capacities of sending a man to Mars and be at a complete loss when it comes to getting right with God and sending your soul to heaven. I'll never forget the president of a major computer corporation of the Southeast. He was a representative from Southeast, but he was the president of this. He pulled up in front of my office. This is when I was in Northern Alabama. And I remember that, that shiny Mercedes Benz pulling up and he got out of his car, came up to my office. He came in, sat down and told me who he was. And he said, I just want you to know, sir, I am worth millions. I'm worth millions. And then he started to cry. And he said, my wife has left me. My son is on drugs. My daughter's pregnant. I want to kill myself. Can you help me? Isn't it amazing, friend? Someone who can amass millions on the face of this earth can't keep his daughter from getting pregnant. Can't keep his marriage together. Can't keep his son off drugs. But millions, he can pay the salaries of countless employees, but he can't keep his family together. And he wanted me to give him some quick little simple three-point way out. And I looked at him and I said, sir, what you need to do first of all is repent. You're a sinner. You're a sinner. And all that you're doing right now is, is, is all the product of a sinful lifestyle. And he squalled and he bawled and for an hour, friend, he got on his knees in that office and confessed every hideous sin that he'd ever been involved in. Gave his life to Jesus, cried, cried, asked for Jesus to forgive him, squalled and bawled. He finally got to the place where he's saying, Jesus, if you don't feed me, I'm going to die. You might make great grades in school and even make the honor roll and your parents got a bumper sticker that says, my kid's an honor roll student. <laughs> parents, if you got one of those of your kid on your bumper, put another, if you got two or three kids and the other ones aren't honor roll, get some bumper sticker for them too, okay? You know, my other kid's good at basketball or something. I want to tell you why. Because your honor roll student might grow up to be a bank robber. And your kid that you think is never going to make it might grow up and be the president. So give him a stick or two. You might be a total genius at operating your own business. I didn't finish the other one, did I? You might make great grades in school and even make the honor roll, but you flunk out with God and aren't even listed on his roll. You might be a total genius at operating your own business and be a complete failure at God's business. You could be in tip-top shape running marathons and be voted by your colleagues as a best athlete and finish What? <laughs> in front of the race and be a total wipeout and be a total wipeout when it comes to your spiritual shape and running God's race and even making it to the finish line. Are you at the end, friend, of your rope tonight? Are you tired? You tired of the way things are going? When I give this altar call in just a minute and Charity sings Run to the Mercy Seat, we're calling for people that are tired of where they're at. We're calling for people that are tired of the same old, same old. Some of you in this place that are religious, when are you going to get sick and tired of religion? When are you going to get sick and... Tomorrow's Sunday. 
Some of you are going to go out to some church 100, 200 miles away. Maybe you're the pastor, maybe you're not. Maybe you, it's just a church you've been in all your life. And you come in, you sing the hymns, you look over there, and you know Joe down the road there, sitting down the pew, he's in adultery, been in adultery for years, but he's taking up the offering. And you look up in the choir, and they're singing like angels, but you know a couple devils up there. And the reason sinners don't come to your church is because they know them too. They know them, friend. See, a lot of this stuff that they say on the streets is true. They say, why should I go there? Man, I know Jim. He goes there, and he drinks with me at work. But he's one of the deacons there at the church. When are you going to get sick of religion? When are you going to get sick of the hypocrisy? When are you going to get tired, friend, of getting up in the morning? No, you took the roast out the night before to let it thaw. Okay, and it thawed through the night. And right around the time before you go to church, you take the roast, you wrap it good, you, you, you put it in the pan, you put it in the oven, you set the timer. Why? Because you know exactly when you're going to get home. When are you going to get tired of that, friend? What is it? What is that? What, it, what is that? What is that like, you know, God's hour with you? Is that, does he, is he up there going, here they come. Oh, boy. They're singing our favorite song, Amazing Grace, how sweet. Friend, I don't think so. He doesn't see that. You're not hungry. When are you going to get tired of that, friend? When are you going to get your family up and go, family, let's go. Who cares about the roast? Who cares about anything? Let's get to church and worship God. you got to be hungry. Well, this centurion was at the place where he couldn't do anything about his situation. The second point is this. You better have a correct analysis of yourself. Correct analysis of yourself. An analysis is this. And it's an examination to discover the ingredients of something true. See, the true ingredients of something. An, an analysis is what makes you tick. What is in, who are you inside? Who are you really? Not what other people say you are, but who are you? A correct analysis of you. People can come up to me and say, Steve, you're a great preacher. Well, that's what they say I am, okay? I know who I am, okay? People can come up to pastors and say, John Kilpatrick, you're the best pastor in the nation. But see, John Kilpatrick knows John Kilpatrick. I live in a different world than you see. I live in the Steve Hill world. I don't know what world you live in, but you probably live in the same kind of world. You have to deal with self all the time. And you have to have a correct analysis you can sing like an angel on Sunday morning and everybody claps, but you know who you are on Sunday night. You know who you are on Monday morning. You know if you're a bear to live with. You know if you're a grouch. You know if you're a pain. You know whether or not you're a snot. You have to have a correct analysis of yourself. The Bible says in verse 4 of this scripture, he is worthy the people said about the centurion, he's worthy for you to grant this to him. For he loves our nation, and it is he who built our synagogue. He is worthy. Friend, you might be here tonight, you're a pastor. And people are saying, he's our pastor. He organized this trip. He's the one that got us all here. He's a wonderful man. Shake it loose, friend. Shake it loose. Shake all that loose. Get the correct analysis of you. Who are you really? What makes you tick? What are you going through? This man, the reason he received his miracle is because he knew who he was. His analysis was totally different from what other people said. He said in verse 6, I am not worthy for you to come under my roof, Jesus. Isn't that something? Everybody else says, you're worthy. He says, no, I'm not. Whew. Boy, this should be preached around this nation, friend. We got about puffed up preachers. Man, I walked into one church one time. I preached all over this nation. I preached in mega churches and little churches. 
I went to one church one time. I'll never forget this. I walked in, and the lady goes, you got to meet our pastor. He's the greatest. He is wonderful. And I appreciate that, friend. I appreciate people loving their pastor, but this was weird. <laughs> this, was, this was strange. And I met that several people. Then I walked into his office, and there was big signs with his name on it and big pictures hanging in the hallways of him. He was everywhere. Something was wrong with that picture, friend. And when I met him, he wanted to make sure I was meeting him. You know what I mean, friend? Do you realize who you're sitting with right here? The Bible says something different about us, friend. The Bible says in Isaiah 66, 2, to this one I will look, to him who is humble and broken in spirit and who trembles at my word. Pastor, that's a good scripture to preach on. You want a simple three-pointer? Isaiah 66, 2. To this one I will look. You want God to look at you? He'll look at you if you're humble, broken in spirit, and you tremble at his word. A, B, C. He'll look at a humble man, but the Bible also says, I believe it's in James, he resists the proud. He resists the proud. Could you imagine if the centurion got around Jesus and said, you know, as a matter of fact, I'm somebody. I'm a hot shot. Friend, I believe Jesus would have walked on by. Walked on by. No, but I'm not worthy, Jesus, for you to come under my roof. Is anybody listening? So if you're a snot here tonight, for those of you translating from other nations, <laughs> How does one say snot in Korean? <laughs> snot is a word that we use for, for people who, uh, <laughs> let's see, let me rub my nose here. <laughs> Those of you visiting from other nations in the United States, and you may have them in your nation, I'm sure you do, we have people in this nation that believe they're important. And when they walk into a room, they want everyone to notice them. They're somebody. They spent hours getting ready to come to revival because they think everyone is looking at them. Everyone's going to stare at them tonight. I got news for you, Charlie. Got news for you, sis. We don't come to look at you. I preached two years ago in this place a message entitled, God Snubs Snots. Because there's so much pride in this nation. He turns from snots, friend. People that think they're somebody. This centurion was the opposite. He was humble. Friend, if you want the Lord to touch you, be honest about yourself. God first looked at Steve Hill. He looked at my life when I was broken, humble, and ready for a touch from him. My last point tonight is this. You've already come to the end of your limitations. You already got a correct analysis of yourself. And the last one is just as important as the first two. The centurion let the Lord take command. You got to let the Lord take command. Is anybody listening? This is the hard part. The centurion was a man with authority. He wasn't accustomed to always giving up his authority. He was accustomed to shelling out his authority. You do this, you do that. But what did he do in this case? He came to the end of his limitations. He couldn't do anything more. He was at the end of his rope. 
He knew who he was. He had a correct analysis of himself. He was humble. He was not worthy to be, in, be around Jesus. And then he said, Jesus, just say the word and my servant will be healed. He let Jesus take command. He didn't walk up and say, Jesus, this is how it's going to work. Number one, you're coming over. You hear me? Number two, you're going to bring those two men that are with you. I don't want the rest of them. I want Peter and John. They're your favorites. I want them with you. No, friend. He let Jesus take command. And tonight, if you're humble, you're going to be like one of the Ethiopians that is in a food line. They'll stand in the food line. Regardless of what area of the world, friend, food lines are food lines. You watch them in America, the Great Depression. You can still watch the films of these people standing in the soup lines. They finally make it up. You don't hear them ever cursing the people feeding them. Ever. You see them with expressions on their face like this. Like this. And then you'll, if you'll watch the films, you'll hear them say, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. They'll walk off and they'll sit on the curb of the street and eat their soup and drink their hot tea. Why? The people in the food line are in command. They're the one dishing out the food. They're the ones giving. The food line people, the ones in the line, are the ones receiving. The ones in the, in the kitchen are the ones that have the power to give. The ones in the line, all they can do is receive. So you let them take command. You let Jesus take command, friend. He's the one that can heal your body. He's the one that can forgive your sins. He's the one that can forgive you, friend. He's the one that can wash you clean. You don't come to him with some agenda tonight. I love the way Jesus commanded people all the time. Go wash in the pool of Siloam. Zacchaeus, get down from the tree. I love that. Peter, John, come here. Get out of the boat. Follow me and I'll make you fish as a man. I love stuff like that, friend. He didn't say, let me get down in your boat. I'll make you fish as a man. Follow me. Over here. Peter, go catch a fish. You'll find a coin in the mouth. I always commanded people, the woman that was bent over in the temple, bent over, sick. I can imagine this frail woman in that church. Jesus, the Bible says, called her across the synagogue. Woman, come here. Come here. He took command. You let Jesus take command. If he's dealing with your sin tonight, you let him take command. He's pointed at it. Then yet let him take command. If he says, get up and come to that altar, you get up and come to the altar. You let him take command. You don't call the shots. You don't sit there and say, all right, all right, Jesus, I'm into pornography, but I'm going to sit in my pew. I'm going to sit up here in the balcony, and I'm going to deal with it right here. No, friend, you don't call the shots. Jesus calls the shots. You let him take command. Just say the word, the centurion said, and he'll be healed. Whatever Jesus says to you, you do it tonight, friend. Everyone stand. Those of you with the chairs, move them to the left and the right. If you're going to sneak out right now, friend, some of you are sneaking out to go to the bathroom. We got speakers in the bathroom if you think you're getting away. Got half a mind to put a speaker system out in the bushes out there, too. <laughs> By the way, you can't get away from God. It's not the preacher, friend. If God's after you, hang it up. Throw in the weapons, man. Throw in your sword. It's over. He's after you, friend. He'll hunt you down. If your picture, by the way, is on this table over here, you're dead meat. You might as well... You might as well get saved right now. We got so many stories, friend, and these stories are true. I mean, it's un the stories that come off that table will blow your mind. But one of the earliest stories we heard, some lady put her husband's picture on that table. He was out in... I don't know, Arizona somewhere driving a truck, truck driver, nasty truck driver. How many have been in a nasty truck stop? He is one of those that 
patronize that nasty place. He was a nasty man. And he, he was on his nasty way out in the nasty avenue, and she put his picture on this table. So he was at a truck stop, and he started he walked out of the truck stop to go to his truck with his key. And he tried to get in in the hole, and then he wasn't drunk. He couldn't turn the key in the hole. And when he was standing there, we know this because he testified at the revival later, heathen, pornography, junk, a heathen. He couldn't turn the key. While he was standing there, the presence of God came all over him. He fell to the ground on the pavement in the truck stop and gave his life to Jesus right there. Right there. Then he put the key in the hole, turned it, opened the truck, went to the first thing he did, he went to the back of the truck, the cab of the truck, got all the porno magazines and all the filthy videos and destroyed them all. He, shared, he testified. But friend, you can't get away from God. You can't get away from God. We've heard so many baptisms, so many people testify, and this is how they open the baptismal testimony. They'll say, hi, my name's Judy. I'm from uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and my picture was on the table. You know, that's how they open it up. And it's just like, you know, that's how it all happened right over there. That's my story. My mama put my picture on the table. And then they share how they were into this, prostitution, this, that. Friend, somebody's praying for you. If you're here tonight, and how many are here tonight? Good. <laughs> Few of you are unsure. A wife going, yeah, honey, raise your hand. You can raise your hand on this one. <laughs> Help me, baby, on this one. This is a tough one. Help me, Jesus. And God has spoken to you tonight about the sin in your life, friend. If he's spoken to you tonight, you're going to be plagued tomorrow too. It'll bother you on Monday, bother you on Tuesday. It'll bother you next month because God's after you. And when the creator of the universe is after you, he don't need no chip in your arm to find you. He doesn't need no satellite system, friend. He sees everywhere you go. He sees you in the X-rated peephole parlors. He sees you everywhere, friend. He knows, there's always three witnesses to everything you do, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. He sees everything you do, everywhere you go. So you might as well hang it up. Come to Jesus. Give your life to him. And I believe some folks here, you didn't realize how hungry you were for God. But a few minutes ago when we were worshiping and this place entered into singing before the Lord, wasn't that awesome? I believe some of you in this room that came here with no intention of going after God were, were standing or sitting in this place going, man, this is what I've longed for all my life. And you had no intention of giving your life to Jesus, but now you're ready. You are ready right now to turn it all over. You want your life to change. You've got to come to the end of your limitations, friend. You can't do anything else for your own soul. The last thing you can do tonight is come to him. That's, that's the only thing you got left. You come to Jesus. No bargaining chips. All the cards on the table saying, Jesus, your blood, the cross, the payment you made 2,000 years ago for me, I'm turning it all in, Jesus. You shed your blood. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus, you gave. You gave your life for me. Now I'm giving my life to you. This is how it's going to work. Charity's going to sing, run to the mercy seat. Everyone in this room that has sin in their life, I know we're crowded, but I want everyone to pay attention. And there's going to be room, okay? Even if you're crammed on the stairway, you come quickly down the stairway and don't let, don't let anyone ever stop you from coming to Jesus. All right? Some lame excuse that there's three people in my row. Friend, if I was going to come to Jesus in your row, I would say something nice like, would you get out of my way? <laughs> so I could get through, you know? Don't, don't be all shy, you know? They will step out of the way and they may go in themselves, but they'll step out of the way for you, friend. 
But tonight, those of you in this room that are backslidden, you know you're doing things that Jesus would never do. I want God to speak to you right now. Listen up. If the Holy Spirit right now went to your house and went through your video cabinet, would he be grieved? It's quiet in here. Would he be grieved? I want to tell you, the Holy Spirit can go to my cabinet right now, and I have a video cabinet. There's not a thing in that video cabinet that would grieve the Holy Ghost. Not one thing. There's not one movie that has one cuss word on it. Not one. Nothing. Nothing would grieve the Lord. There's not one movie with any lewd scene on it at all. No nudity. Nothing. It's clean. Why? I want God in my life. I don't want hypocrisy. I'm asking you, friend. Do you find yourself, do you find yourself slipping away from Jesus? And it's almost like taking a little mini vacation from your, your life and you slip into a little pornography, you slip into a little R-rated movie. Do you find yourself going to Blockbuster Video or some others and, and you're pulled towards the more adult videos and you don't want a PG, you want at least a PG-13 or an R because you know it's going to have a good storyline and it's going to have some blood and guts and it's going to have some cussing and nudity in there. You want something that you can chew on. That's so sad, friend. You're in bondage is what you are. You're in bondage to that, friend. That's sin. Jesus would never watch it. How do you know? I'll prove it to you. Next time you're about to watch it, ask a blessing over it. And then say, Jesus, come sit with me right here. Let's listen to them use your name in vain. Let's watch this lewd, nude scene together, Jesus. I don't think so, friend. I don't think so. Quit lying to yourself. It's wrong. It's amazing the reporters this week we've had hard copy with us. But we've had, the reason we, the, the, we allow the media in, friend, is because if you don't let them in, they're going to come in anyhow. We've had every major station in the nation, 2020, Time Magazine, 48 Hours, CNN Twice, CBS, ABC, Good Morning America, The Today Show, they've all come through this place, friend. And most of the programs you've seen have been phenomenal that they've done. And it's amazing some of the things they ask us afterwards. Some of them call us. We're talking secular people. They'll call me up on the telephone, and they'll talk to me about sin. And they'll say, one man said, Steve, I'm doing this. Is this wrong? I say, yes, sir, it is. Major reporter in this nation calls me off the record. Want to know why he had to call me? Because deep down inside, he knew it was wrong. He knew it was wrong. He wanted me to confirm the convictions that he felt about it. Another reporter called me up. Major newspaper, major reporter. He said this, Steve, how much time do I have? He's in sin, but he knows that the Lord's coming back. And I said, you ain't got much time, buddy. Off the record, major people, major players. They know, friend, deep down inside, and you know that there's something wrong. That's another reason we let the media come in. We've never invited anybody because we know they need the gospel just like everybody else. The Today Show, when the Today Show came, I believe it was Lucky Severson, he came up to me afterwards, he said, I have been witnessed to 73 times. <laughs> he said, I'll walk up to somebody and I'll say, I'm Lucky Severson with the Today Show. They'll go, I don't care, do you know Jesus? And they'll go, <laughs> And these are the folks in line that are doing this kind of stuff. I mean, they're like, I don't care who you are. You can be Ted Turner. Do you know the Lord? You need Jesus in your life, man. It's powerful. This revival is powerful, friend. It's affecting the it's affecting the world. But these people, they, they leave out with that same thing, that conviction. They heard what they felt in their heart all along. Somebody finally vocalized what was going on inside their heart. They knew it was wrong. 
that little side affair that they're having. Even though the world says it's okay to have a lady on the side, they knew it was wrong. They felt it was wrong. To even be flirting with it, they knew it was wrong. Then they come to this revival and somebody nails them from the Word. So tonight, you're doing things that you know you're not supposed to be doing. You're backslidden. You've slidden away from God. One of the surefire ways to know whether or not you've slidden away from God is that the little things don't bother you anymore. And friend, if the little sins, what I, and I don't know what they are, every sin's major to me, but if the little things don't bother you anymore, like a little cussing, a little lewdness, a little nudity, if you can walk into a Walmart and look up at a magazine cover and, and stare at that woman on that magazine cover, sir, without turning your head, you can just stare at her, you're a sinner. You're in sin. Jesus would not stand there looking at her. He'd turn his head. But no, you're, you're in sin. Sin's got a hold of you, friend. He's got a hold of you. I know this is, this is meat and potatoes gospel right here. This is simplicity. But Jesus said to his disciples, he said, if you look upon a woman with lust in your heart, you've committed it. You've committed it. That's heavy. I heard a pastor preach one time about the spirit of murder. And I'd never heard this in my life. He said, if you're in this room and you fantasize about living with someone else, you're married, but you, you, you think about going Christmas shopping with another woman, going on vacation with another woman and her raising your children. You're not in adultery. You're not doing any of that. But you fantasize, what would it be like being with her rather than my wife? What would it be like being with him rather than my husband? He said, that's called the spirit of murder. That's how murders are performed. They're thought out in the heart first. The murderer eliminates the person from the scene, from life. What would it be like if he was gone? And then they go out and commit the crime. Some of you in this room may be very guilty of the spirit of murder. You've already killed your mate in your heart. You've never committed adultery, but you're dreaming about it. Friend, it's repent time. It's repent time. It's get right with God time. Those of you in this room that are religious, you're religious. You do all the right things. You've got your table set, but you don't know God. You're going to come quickly, friend, down to this altar and meet God. Because you can go to hell with baptismal waters on your face. You can go to hell, friend, with a communion cup in your hand and a wafer in your mouth. You can go to hell. And nations, this nation's learning this, friend. It's taken a while to give this nation an education about religion. Religion will damn your soul, friend. It'll damn you. Religion. All across America tomorrow morning and all over your European countries that are represented here, all over the world, people are going to be religious for an hour or two. And they believe because they were religious for an hour or two, they're saved. It's a lie from the pits of hell, friend. The devil works overtime on Sunday morning waking people up, getting them to church just so they'll do their little time to God, make them feel good. Somebody stands over them and says, your sins are all forgiven. And they go home and sin like the devil. Someone told them since grade school that if you just receive Jesus in your heart, it doesn't matter what you do the rest of your life. Just go to church. Live your life. God understands what you're going through. You'll make it to heaven. Religion, friend. You better stick with the book. The book's a little bit heavier. The book says, like, without holiness, no man will see the Lord. And I've personally chosen in my life to not drive the nails any deeper in my Savior's hands and feet. I don't want to slam that hammer down by sinning every day. I want him to look at me and be pleased. So, friend, if you're religious tonight, but you don't know him, if you're not on fire for Jesus, Brother Wetzel shared it so well just a few minutes ago. He said, Christians are supposed to be on fire like a bride. If you're not on fire like a bride, friend, I question whether you even know Jesus. Whether you even know Jesus. A lot of heads just went down. I know it's strong, friend, 
But if you think it's strong, too strong, then I want you to talk to the Father about it. Go to him and say, Steve's too strong. He, he's saying, Father, that I'm supposed to be on fire for your son, Jesus. He's saying that I'm supposed to be white hot. That I'm supposed to wake up in the morning with Jesus on my heart. Go to sleep at night with Jesus. You know what he said to me, Father? He said, if I'm watching movies with, with lustful scenes on them, that it grieves the Holy Spirit, Father. Take it up with God. Don't take it up with me, friend. But see, in your own spirit, you know it's wrong. But you battle, you fight. When are you going to give in? Remember the last point. Let the Lord take command. Let him call the shots. And that's what he's trying to do in this place. And those of you in this room that have never known the Lord, you're going to come to Jesus. He was crucified on Calvary 2,000 years ago. Buddha never did anything for you, Bubba. Those psychics you're calling don't care about your soul. If they did, it'd be 1-800, not 1-900. Nobody cares about you like Jesus. No one cares for you like Jesus. He loves you. And he's waiting at these altars right here to forgive you, to wash you, to cleanse you, and to make you new. Now, Charity's going to sing, run to the mercy seat. The only thing that's going to keep you back, friend, is pride. And I've already touched on pride. You know there's sin in your life. You're away from God, and you need forgiveness. Pride says this, what will my brother think? What will my sister think? What will Joe think? What will Barbara think? What will my pastor think? What will my parishioners think? What will my wife, my daughter, my husband think? Friend, you came into this world alone, and you're going to leave alone. Okay? What does someone else's opinion have to do with this right now? Make it on your own. I'm a married man with three children, but when it comes to Jesus, I don't go to my wife and ask her permission to pray. I don't go to my wife and say, honey, do I need to go and, and read the word? No, I go after Jesus the way I go, I go after. She goes after Jesus. Why? Because when I die and she dies, if my whole family dies in a car accident, it's over. We're alone. I stand before God. It is appointed unto man once to die and after that to judgment. For who? Steve Hill. It's not a corporate thing, friend. I'll stand before God alone. And you're standing before God alone right here. What are you going to do with your life? Right now, Charity's going to sing, Run to the Mercy Seat. Everyone who's away from God, everyone who needs forgiveness, you're at the end of your rope, you want Jesus. Come on right now. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Let's go. Come on. In the darkness where everything is unknown. Come on, in the balcony, let's go. Come on, in the balcony, let's go. Come on, get on your face before the Lord, let's go. Hurry, hurry. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. God bless you, man. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. How about it, friend? Are you another hungry heart? Are you hungry like the centurions? Are you willing to come to the end of your limitations? Are you willing for him to give it all to Jesus? Are you willing to let him take total command right now? Get on your face and say, Jesus, wash me, cleanse me, make me new. I need you, Jesus. I need you now. If you don't come into my life, if you don't change me, I'm going to die in my sins right now. Come on, friend. Give your life to Jesus. Let's go. Let's go. Hurry. Hurry. Come on, come on. Yes, in the balcony, let's go. Come on, come on. Come on, come on. Hurry, look at this. Hurry, 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 hurry. 
altar stay right where you're at stay right where you're at everyone at the altar the Lord just spoke to me about doing something some of you are so bound by the devil I'm gonna I'm gonna bind Satan right now from your life some of you he's got you shackled he's got you shamed you've got doubt in your mind if I slip out it'll never work if I slip out of my pew I'll never be able to live it that's a lie from the pits of hell friend if the devil's saying to that you then the opposite is true if he's telling you you can't live it the truth is you can live it. You're going to be able to live it. You need to break away. You need to break away. Right now, I'm going to bind the devil from your life. I'm going to bind him from your life. And if you know you're supposed, everyone that's not at this altar, I want you to stand. Everyone that's not at this altar, stand. Y'all can keep coming. God bless you. I'm going to break the chains right now, friend. There's authority in this place. When I do this, as soon as the chains are broken, if you don't slip out and you know you're supposed to be down here, friend, what you've said to the devil is, would you please put the shackles around my ankles again? That's what you're saying, because I'm going to snap them right now. But by, if you know you're supposed to be down here and you don't move out, what you're doing to the devil is saying, welcome, Lucifer. Welcome into my life. Take me, Lucifer. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, Satan, I bind you. I bind every foul spirit. I bind every demon in this place. I bind you lust demon. I bind you demon. Those demons of doubt, I bind you tonight. I bind you liar, you father of lies. I bind you right now. I bind you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Now come on, hurry. 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 God bless you. Come on. Come on. Hurry. 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 Hurry.
I'm going to close. No music. We're going to close this in 15 seconds. If you're not here in 15 seconds, you're going to miss it. Come on, you can, kill, you can come. Come on. Hurry. 13. 11. Come on down. 9. 8. 7. 6. Come on down. God bless you. Hurry. 4. 3. Somebody's praying for you, friend. God bless you, sis. God bless you, sir. Come on, man, hurry. Break away. Come on down. Come on down, guys. God bless both of y'all. Yes, God bless you, sir. Glory. Lord. I'm at the end of my limitations, Jesus. I can't go any further. I need you and you alone. Shh. Everyone at this altar, bow your heads, close your eyes. We're going to pray together. No one looking around at this altar. No one looking around, your heads bowed. God is in the forgiving business. He's going to wash you, cleanse you. Friend, don't let the devil lie to you right now. If you'll confess your sin right now to Jesus, and we're going to do this through this prayer, the Lord's going to wash you clean. I'm talking about if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. He's going to wash you clean. He'll cleanse you. Everyone at this altar, pray with me right now. Whether you're backslidden, you've never known the Lord, or you're just a church religious person and you're away from God, I want you to pray with me. Everyone at this altar, dear Jesus. Dear and we're going to do that again, friends. Some of you mumbled. And I want to tell you, if you will, this is Saturday night. If you'll vocalize this prayer, it'll do your soul good right now. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus thank, you thank you for speaking to me. Speaking to thank, me. You, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, for your presence, for your presence in, this place. in this place. You're looking at, You're looking at a hungry human being. Hungry human being. I, need I need you. I'm at the very end. The very end. I can't go any further. I need you. I need your forgiveness. I recognize who you are. You are everything to me. And tonight, Jesus, I give you total control. You take command. I confess to you that I have sinned. I have hurt you. I've hurt others. And I've hurt myself. Forgive me, Jesus. Wash me clean. Make me new. I repent. I ask you tonight to be my Savior, my Lord, and my very best friend. From this moment on, I am yours, and you are mine. Come, Jesus. Live your life through me. In your precious name, in the name of Jesus, amen. Hallelujah.